just a little follow-up on the last video concerning uh, Abraham and that time, um, the, the meridian of time. Uh, many pointed out that the meridian isn't necessarily the middle, but it is an interpretation, but it typically means a high point or, or the apex of a, of a time period. Okay, but, but that's okay. It's, it's good to have a, a little discussion going on here. One thing I wanted to bring out, and I forgot, I totally forgot this, but this is, this is kind of cool. So verse 17 of Matthew 1, after it goes this, through this genealogy from Abraham to Christ, it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations, and from carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. The carrying to Babylon is interesting because that's kind of the midpoint of the generations, and that's when Lehi left and, and brought forth the new covenant, which I want to talk about this new covenant in, in just a minute. So, but we have these 14, 14, and 14, right? Pretty interesting. Um, all divisions of seven, number of completion. The number seven is very significant, very significant. And we all know that. So we have 14, 14, and then we have another 14, which gives us 42, is that right? All divisions of seven. So 42, if, if we take, so, so a generation, um, we think of, well, if, if there's 42 generations between um, Abraham and Christ, and there's 2,000 years between Abraham and Christ, we can divide 42 into 2,000. And I know these are rough numbers, but then you get roughly 49. 49 times 42 is roughly 2,000 or thereabouts. It's close. So interesting thing, because we don't know exactly if it's Abraham's birth or his death. We don't know if it's Christ's birth or death, resurrection, that kind of thing. But, but it's, it's, it's in that. So 49 is also a division of seven. So this seems to be really uh, an important genealogy and lineage of Christ. Okay. And I, I can't emphasize enough how fun that was for me to, to just kind of never have seen that before and just stumble on it. And it's just right there before our eyes. Okay, so that's just kind of covering up there. Uh, now I want to get into a covenant, the, the covenant. Now this gets a, a little sticky because this talks about how the earth and the world and the church is under condemnation because we're not adhering to the new covenant, the new covenant. Um, here's what I'm referring to. And, and I'm also going to refer to a talk by President Benson. This is on the church website, the talk. But this, this let's go to the scriptures. This is section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants. So section 84 is one of those just amazing sections. Um, it, it's the... Uh, September of 1832. So many gems in section 84. So we have section 84, section 88, section uh, 93. A lot of them have to do with light and intelligence and all those kind of things, which we all love to study and learn from. But listen to this. Uh, I, so this is section 84, and I'm going to start in verse 48. And the Father teacheth him of the covenant which he has renewed and confirmed upon you, which is confirmed upon you for your sake and not for your sakes only, but for the sake of the whole world. Now, this is cool because this is very reminiscent of Malachi, which said that the whole earth will be a, a waste if if we don't remember the Abrahamic covenant, where the hearts of the children are turned 
to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children, right? And there's a few different very uh, variations of that. And I think we need to really um, not pick one or the other and say this is the way it is because in scripture it's it's a lot it's it's and and that's probably one of the most quoted scriptures it's everywhere it's in the pearl of great price doctrine and covenants a few times and of course um in the bible but okay so um Okay, but, but okay, so now I'm in, in verse 49. And the whole world lieth in sin and groaneth under darkness and under the bondage of sin. So the whole world is in this, in this problem here. So, so we're like, oh, that's great. It's the world. It's not us. It's not us. But let's just keep reading. And by this, you may know, they are under the bondage of sin because they come not unto me. For whosoever cometh not unto me is under the bondage of sin. And whoso receiveth not my voice is not acquainted with my voice and is not of me. And by this ye may know the righteous from the wicked, and that the whole world groaneth under sin and darkness even now. Now, now it starts to get a little sticky for those of us that are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Verse 54, And your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief, because you have treated lightly the things you have received. So now he's talking to the church. Which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. Wow. Wow. Okay, now we're very specific. So vanity and unbelief. What, do, what don't we believe in? And have we, um, as a church, moved past this? So, so now as a church, we're not under this condemnation? Let's keep reading. Verse 56. And this condemnation resteth upon the children of Zion, even all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written, that they may bring forth fruit meat for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, there remaineth a scourge and a judgment to be poured out upon the children of Zion." For, the, for shall the children of the kingdom pollute my holy land? Verily I say unto you, nay. Verily, verily, I say unto you, who now hear my words, which are my voice, blessed are ye inasmuch as ye receive these things. And so here you could say, well, we're not under that condemnation anymore. Have we heard that? Have, has that been told to us that we have, that we're no longer under the condemnation? Let me read. This is from the church website, and it's uh, it's called Book of Mormon Keystone of Our Religion, Chapter Nine. Uh, you can you can just so when you Google something, I've mentioned this many times. Um, just just you could say is the church under condemnation and then put LDS after that. If you're going to use Google, it will take you to the church websites. And, and this is where this popped up. And so this is on the church website, uh, chapter nine, the book of Mormon keystone of our religion. I don't know what chapter nine of what book it is, but it's on the church website. And this is, this is really interesting. Uh, and I'm just going to read from here. On, uh, this is from the life of Ezra Taft Benson. On January 5th, 1986, President Ezra Taft Benson presided at a state conference in Annandale, Virginia. This, his first state conference as president of the church. So he's president of the church presiding at a state conference in Virginia. Latter-day Saints in attendance were visibly moved as they listened to him speak. In his sermon, he bore testimony of the power of the Book of Mormon to change lives and to lead people to Christ. He issued a spirited challenge to study this book of scripture. Uh, 
This message was not new in President Benson's ministry. As a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, he had frequently encouraged Latter-day Saints to study the Book of Mormon and follow its teachings. But as president of the church, he was inspired to emphasize the message even more. He said, The Lord inspired his servant, Lorenzo Snow, to re-emphasize the principle of tithing to redeem the church from financial bondage. Now in our day, the Lord has revealed the need to re-emphasize the Book of Mormon. President Benson testified of the Book of Mormon wherever he went in missionary meetings, stakes, and regional conference, general conference, and meetings with general authorities. In his first general conference address as president of the church, President Benson shared one reason for the urgency of this message. And, and listen to this. This is a quote. Unless we read the Book of Mormon and give heed to its teachings, he warned, the Lord has stated in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, the whole church is under condemnation. And this condemnation rests upon the children of Zion, even all. The Lord continues, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandment which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. The following quotations, all from sermons President Benson delivered as president of the church, provides a sampling of his warnings and promises related to the Book of Mormon. And then it goes through several um, promises uh, and blessings that President Benson gave to the church if we would read, study, and adhere to the teachings that are found in the Book of Mormon. So... My feeling on this, if anybody cares, is that we're still under this condemnation as a church, as, as a Zion people. So this is an interesting thing because it says Zion is under condemnation. So you can still have Zion and a new Jerusalem, not the new Jerusalem when Christ comes, but a new Jerusalem and a Zion but still be under condemnation because we're not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing. And this is a covenant. So why is the Book of Mormon called a covenant? And, and what is in the Book of Mormon that would be a covenant? Um, before, before I answer that question, uh, it, at least my, give my opinion. I, I'm not going to answer any questions. Uh, the Spirit answers questions. I just bring stuff up and give my opinion, right? Um, just back to that quote where um, President Benson said that the Lord revealed to him that this is an important thing. Um, You know, we often hear the quote, and I think it was President Benson who said, just I think in the 14 uh, points or standards of following a prophet, the address he gave at BYU, he said, "It doesn't a, a prophet. The, the words don't have to be prophetic. Um, let's see. Uh, you don't have to say, thus saith the Lord,' in order for the, the, all the words to be prophetic. But does that mean that we'll never hear that again? Thus saith the Lord from a prophet. Um, I think it's kind of interesting. I do. I think it's interesting that we." We don't hear that kind of talk anymore. Thus saith the Lord, or the Lord revealed to me, or speaking uh, in first person that as if the Lord is speaking, as we read in the Doctrine and Covenants so many times. The other thing I don't know if we'll ever hear again is uh, the Lord condemning or rebuking his, his prophet or his servants. That are, that are leadership. Um, let, let me read one here uh, in section 93, which is the same time period of section 84, which I just, I just love it, but the, the Kirtland era. But, but listen to this. Can you imagine if this was ever said? Uh, Verily I say unto you, so I'm in verse 45. Of section 93. Verily I say unto you, my servant Joseph Smith Jr., or in other words, I call you friends, for you are my friends, and ye shall have an inheritance with me. So this is the Lord speaking to Joseph Smith. 
we, we take it for granted that we hear things like this or read things like this. Now, I call you servants for the world's sake, and ye are their servants for my sake. That is one of the, the most important scriptures when it comes to the organization of the church in the latter days, I think, is verse 46 of section 93. I call you servants for the world's sake, and ye are their servants for my sake. I love that. It just puts it all in perspective. But now listen to this, verse 47. And now verily I say unto you, Joseph Smith Jr., you have not kept the commandments and must needs stand rebuked before the Lord. Your family must needs repent and forsake some things and give more earnest heed unto your sayings or be removed out of their place. (laughs) Can you imagine if we had a, a general conference and any one of, you know, whether it was any of them, where they they would say that the Lord revealed to them that they that He re, is rebuking them and calling them to repentance. It would it it would really change how we view things. I think, uh, and the culture of the church, where it's like. Everything is just perfect in all of their lives, all of their family, and we're there to sit at their their feet and just hang on every single word that comes out of their mouth as if they have no issues and there's no problems. I, I can guarantee you, sorry about these uh, noises in here, but I can guarantee you that they all just have lives just like we do. Uh, granted, in, in the sense that they're dealing with issues, worldly issues, family issues, uh, health issues, all the things that, that we wake up in the morning and go, dang, <laughs> what's, what's today going to bring, right? So they, they have these things, but... And... and, and to be fair, Joseph Smith was rebuked very, very few times. Probably the 116 pages is, is the one that we see the most where he just thought it was all gone, all lost. Uh, he was rebuked. He lost his priv- privileges as a prophet, seer, and revelator. And that brings up another interesting question now that I'm just rambling here. But when did Joseph Smith become a prophet? I've, I brought this up before, but but w- was he a prophet when he lost the 116 pages, or did he not become a prophet till the organization of the church? Is that when he became a prophet? So he wasn't a prophet in the sacred grove as a 14 year old boy. He saw God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ, but he's not a prophet. You, you see, you see where you can go with this. He wasn't baptized. He didn't have the priesthood. All these kind of things. These are questions that I think are good to to. Um, uh, try to contemplate. And me personally, I think he was a prophet when he entered the grove and came out of the grove. That experience of going in and coming out, preparing for the grove experience, that's that's when he became a prophet. And and you could say small p, large p, I don't really care. He was he was a prophet. He saw God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ, face to face. Right? And, and that, that qualified him in every sense to be the prophet of God and the prophet of this dispensation, the last dispensation. So let's, let's go back to this condemnation, um, not of Joseph Smith, but of the church. So back in section 84, let's look at a couple of scripture cross-references that I picked up on that I think maybe might, I don't know, they they might be helpful. Um, So verse 55 of section 84, it says, which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation. Vanity and unbelief. Uh, Let's go to Messiah 26 because we we are in Messiah and we're, we're not here yet, but it, it really, um, I think, 
we're, we're reading in, in the beginnings of Mosiah after King Benjamin's address, right? We're, we finished up King Benjamin's address. And so, um, let's see, where was that again? And this last part of Mosiah, if I can find it here. I apologize. Mosiah 26. So if we go to Mosiah 26, let's, there, there's some really interesting things here that I think will help us understand um, what, what is happening in the Doctrine and Covenants, what's happening today in the church, and then what happened back then. So Mosiah 26, right at the beginning, um, now it came to pass, so on Isaiah 26, verse 1, that there were many of the rising generation that could not understand the words of King Benjamin. Hmm. A rising generation that could not understand Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow. Okay. We, we, we can go down. President Benson, this rising generation just can't quite grasp this, this kind of talk, right? So let's, let's keep reading here. They could not understand the words of King Benjamin, being little children at the time he spake unto his people, and they did not believe the traditions of their fathers. Ooh, okay, traditions of their fathers. So their fathers would teach them and mothers of what King Benjamin taught. But they were like, you know what? If we remember him, we hardly remember him. And we don't really remember his words. You might have liked it, but we don't. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay. They did not believe what had been said concerning the resurrection of the dead, neither did they believe concerning the coming of Christ. So these are the two elements that they didn't believe from King Benjamin. Uh, don't you think it's interesting that this boiled down to the resurrection of the dead and the coming of Christ? I think that is exactly what causes apostasy in our church today. Resurrection of the dead kind of means to me that there's an accountability and that there, that there is life after death and then, and then there's a quality of that life after death and all the things that go along with the resurrection. And if you just don't believe in that, then you really don't need to adhere to any covenants. You don't need to adhere to any gospel or doctrine of Christ. And then the second coming or the coming of Christ that's the, those are the two things that they stop believing in. To me, this is the, the, the first steps of apostasy. Stop believing in the resurrection and, and believing in the coming of Christ. How many, how many times have you heard, ah, you know what, Christ isn't coming, or if he is, it's so far away, it's not even, it's not even in the picture. It's not even in the picture. Now, if you have that belief, you're going you're gonna to live your life a whole lot different, right? So let's keep reading and see what happened to these folks. So not believing in the resurrection of the dead and not believing concerning the coming of Christ. I wrote that down in the first steps of apostasy. And now because of their unbelief, I'm in verse 3 now, and I'm in chapter 26 of Messiah. And now because of their unbelief, they could not understand the word of God and their hearts were hardened. That's the third step. Hearts become hardened. Have we seen that in the church? Yeah. And they would not be baptized, neither would they join the church. And they were a separate people as to their faith. 
and remain so ever after, even in their carnal and sinful state, for they would not call upon the Lord their God. They wouldn't pray. So you stop believing in the resurrection of the dead. You stop believing that Christ is going to come. Um, you harden, let's see, you harden your heart and you stop praying. Pretty much the four elements of apostasy right there. And this is what I see happening. Um, and, you know, it's it's always, it's, it's like that, that saying <laughs> that there's only um, one thing worse than going through a depression, uh, you know, economic depression, and that's having parents that went through the depression. And, and so as, as we age, we become our parents, and then we start saying, oh, those young whippersnappers, they don't know anything. This, this, is, just, this is just what happens. So, so when you get to a certain age, you can talk this way and get away with it. Uh, however, I do think there is some uh, legitimacy to this, this claim that the further we get away from the Joseph Smith-esque prophecies, the, the harder it is for younger people to, to believe. Now, we have the blessing of having the scriptures and the words written down where we can look at them and study them and hear them. And here, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord spoke to my mind and said this and this and this. Personally, I would like to hear that more instead of just these personal stories and things that, uh, you know, they're, they're nice to hear, but, but we, we need the meat. We need the meat of the new covenant. Now, talking about the covenant. Why is the Book of Mormon called a covenant? Well, covenant is a testament. It's a testament. It's a testament of Christ. It's another witness. It's another covenant of Christ. Christ is the covenant. Christ is the covenant. Christ is the covenant. I will put enmity between thee and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is Christ. You... Satan might have power to bruise his heel, but he will have power to bruise your head. And you could say crush, but sounds better. There's different versions of that, depending on which creation story we're, we're witnessing or hearing or reading. But there's, there's, there's power in Christ. There's power in the covenant. Christ is the covenant. He is the seed. We talk about the Abrahamic covenant is, is the seed. The seed is Christ, right? Coming through Sarah, coming through uh, uh, Rebecca, coming through uh, Rachel and Leah. And we can get into that a little bit uh, later, but Mary has the blood of both Joseph and Judah. And in Christ, we bring the stick of Joseph or Ephraim, and we bring the stick of Judah together. What brings that together? We could say the Bible and the Book of Mormon. That sounds pretty cool for us Latter-day Saints, but in, but in essence, it's Christ it's Christ that brings, it's the testament of Christ. It's the witness. It's the covenant of Christ, or Christ is the covenant. And, and you bring this covenant and this covenant, and who brings them together? Jesus Christ. It's about him. It's a, those covenants are about him. So it's another witness, okay? And we had, we've been given that new witness, as remnants of Jacob, we've been given that witness and we've taken it too lightly. We've taken it too lightly. So I, I know I bring up a lot of different things in, in certain videos and it's just, it's, I, I apologize. I hope the sound is actually on this time. <laughs> Last time I, 
I probably hit the wrong button or something, you know, I'm not really sure what I did. But uh, in any event, I apologize for, for these, these m- m- missteps and for bringing up so many different things. But we want to focus on we're under condemnation for not really uh, taking serious the covenant of the Book of Mormon or the witness of Christ and studying him through the Book of Mormon as another witness of Christ. We're, we're under condemnation for not doing that. And the world's under condemnation for not doing that. It's been provided. It's been provided. It's been shared. So that's the condemnation there. Um, personally, I would like to, I don't have to hear it every single time, thus saith the Lord, or the Lord revealed, or the Spirit told me to do this, but I would like to hear that. I would love to hear that. I would love to hear that the Lord spoke to to us as a as a body or to to me individually as as a leader that this this is the direction or this is what needs to be said um if you can think of that being said you know plain like that in in recent times please point it out um i i can't recall that uh and, and as we read the Doctrine and Covenants, it's, it's virtually every page is the Lord speaking. It's, it's the Lord speaking. And it, I, I, I'm not asking for much, just a little bit. <laughs> so anyway, if you have some thoughts on as to why, why, um, Sister Palmer thinks, isn't that funny? We call our wives Sister Palmer. My wife's not my sister. Well, she is in the gospel sense. But she thinks it's part of the half hour of silence. That, that really, the, the heavens are silent. They're silent through the leaders. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I just... I, I think that's a that's as good as ex- explanation as I can see, but but maybe you can share some thoughts as to why we don't hear it the way we would hear it in the Doctrine and Covenants, and and Brigham Young even had some moments where he did that right, um, but it just seems the further we get away from Joseph Smith, the less authoritative it it sounds. Like we like God telling them to tell us kind of things, right? Now, the other idea, the the one thought that I had is that now it, it could be it could be the silence, but the half hour of silence. But I I think perhaps um, it's it's up to us individually now to get the thus saith the Lord in in our head. And, and that it's no longer sending, you know, Moses to the mountain to find out what the Lord wants and then bring it down to us. It's, it's time for us to do it. So there's that possibility. But, but then it creates this kind of angst a little bit, like, uh, am I getting, uh, do I get my own revelation or do I wait to hear it from the leadership of the church uh, when it's concerning what, you know? There were a lot of revelations given to the prophet Joseph Smith that were for individuals, just for their particular situation. So have, has the church grown out of that? Um, and yeah, so I'm probably asking more questions in this video than I'm trying to give like my opinion, because that's one that I just can't quite figure out why we don't hear that more often now again i know somebody's going to say that it doesn't always have to be thus saith the lord in order to be the word of god i get that but how about just every once in a while can it be thus saith the lord doesn't have to be every time but i i just haven't heard it okay um 
cool thing. Just this is just just a cool thing. Many of you, your prayers, your thoughts with the passing of our little Jane a few months ago. It's it's still just the uh, it's still just I can't even You know, I told you that there was a sanctifying um, experience with it. There was, there's no doubt in, of that. Sue and I talk about it all the time. And Jane's parents, we talk about it all the time. But, you know, you see pictures and you see things and it just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's been tough. But here's kind of a cool thing. And I don't know if it means anything, but it's cool for us. So the very week that she was admitted into the hospital and we never, she never really, she was, she was coherent for a couple of days. But after that, no. And that was the very week that, um, um, our daughter was going to have jaw surgery. So we were already scheduled to go down to watch the kids. And then this all happens and you know, right now. Okay, so then the time of the eclipse, her birthday, we talked about this. The, uh, the Make-A-Wish Foundation had, had reached out to Caitlin and Scott and their family and prov was providing a... Uh, Jane wanted to go to the beach, and so it was a, a Florida vacation over her birthday and, and over the eclipse. We didn't even think of the eclipse. We were to be gone that, that time period to go with them um, to, to have some time with Jane, and she can enjoy the beach. You know, she was doing good. She was in remission, to, and, and so life was good, but... But then events changed, and she passed away. So Make-A-Wish Foundation was notified that, uh, you know, that she had passed. So the trip was canceled. But they reached uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation. Here's where I'm trying to get with this. They reached out to, to our daughter and said, uh, just, awesome, just wonderful condolences and really heartfelt. And said, in for on behalf of, of, of Jane, there's been a star identified and named, officially named in the heavens. Um, you know what? It's a piece of paper, and I don't know if we'll ever see that star. I don't know. I'll, we'll, we'll see. But I thought the... The... Th the idea of that was very touching, very touching. Um, and, you know, we'll look up in the heavens a little differently now um, just because, you know, these things are, um, there's a lot of crap and a lot of things going on in this world, but um, there's some really good things as well. So, um, I think that's it for this video. I, I will probably be bringing up uh, an experience we had in sacrament meeting last this past Sunday, but I'm not going to do it on this video. But hopefully I, I can uh, express what happened in a, in a decent way. I might wait a week before I do it, but um, I, think you, I think you need to know what what happens sometimes in, in a sacrament meeting. It's crazy. Anyway, God bless, and we will talk to you very, very soon. You guys are amazing. I love your comments. I love your... Um, had some pretty good, pretty deep... It, it's hard through mess, you know, the, 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 the YouTube and the comment section, and time-wise, you know, sometimes we just don't have time to answer everything. But, but I thought there were some very, very good and deep uh, discussions. And hopefully, if you didn't contribute to those discussions, you read them and you got something out of it. And I, I would give my opinion and, you know, it might have been brief and short, but it was, it was, you know, 
what I felt. And, and so uh, thank you for, for, for asking. And sometimes they're tough questions too, very tough. So it's all good. Well, we'll talk to you next time here in a couple of days and uh, all is well. We will be going to um, France in a, in a week or two to go to the Traditions of Mary, Mary Magdalene in France. I cannot wait. This will be a great trip and we'll, we'll be able to uh, share some brief videos there and some insights that we're getting there. So God bless. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.